Well, thank you for coming to the party last night. Hopefully you had a, a good time. Uh, I spent some time there as well, walking around, talking to some people. I gotta tell you, I love this city of Austin. You guys picked a really great place to actually have a headquarters. And also, this is a phenomenal event. Um, I, it's been an amazing experience for me to walk around here, talk to people, meet the Xenos people, talk to some of the customers. Um, you know, Tom Mendoza talked about uh, culture in his keynote. And you know, to Greg, Brian, Megan and team, like, from a culture standpoint, you guys are actually doing fantastic. Really smart people, innately passionate, building tremendous products, and moving, moving, at, a, moving at a very fast pace, which is very important. Um, in the spirit of, in the theme of Galaxy, also I want to wish you happy belated summer solstice day. I believe summer solstice was yesterday, which meant that you had a lot of bright light, hopefully more sun this morning than you normally would for your fun run. I, I do, I, I pivoted my talk a little bit. I thought I would kind of snap into part of the, one of the other themes that uh, was been going on at the conference, which is talking about journey. Um, you, uh, Brian gave a brief glimpse into some of my, 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 my previous work. I thought maybe I'd take a couple of steps back and tell you a little bit about my journey about where I got here today and some of the things I've learned along the way and why I believe what Google Cloud is doing is so important, so vitally transformational to the industry, partners like Xenos and customers like yourselves. So going way back, oh, and actually, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this. I'm actually from Hawaii. So when Greg was upset, uh, giving the, the opening keynote and he talked about Hawaii, he's like, I know some of those places. I'm from the big island of Hawaii, however. Um, I believe Greg's slides were from Maui. Um, and the big island actually right now, the, the, the difference is on the big island right now, the rivers are actually running quite red, if you've been following any of the news. Now, public service bulletin for my, my friends and family back on Hawaii, everything's fine. Tourists are welcome. It's not as scary as everybody believes. It is impressive, but it's not as scary as everybody believes. So I grew up in Hawaii. Three generations of Matsubaras are from the big island of Hawaii. Super proud of that, of the culture. Um, and I'm glad I was thrilled to see some of the slides of my homeland uh, first thing here on Wednesday morning. So <clears throat> fast forward a bit. Um, you know, I'm kind of, I, I tell people oftentimes I'm accidentally here. Right? I was supposed to be a doctor. All right? I went to school, I did pre-med, I did all that kind of stuff. I was supposed to go to medical school, and I decided, you know, I'm going to take some time off before I went and did that. And I stumbled into technology back in like 1999, right, as, as an entry-level salesperson. Um, a, a small company called Visio, if you might remember them, they got bought by Microsoft, drawing, diagramming, org charts, and things like that. Quickly after that, though, I went over to a company called Red Hat in the year 2000. So Red Hat in the 2000, if you remember, if you recall, this is back when people couldn't even pronounce Linux. It was either Linux or it was Linux. Open source was this foreign concept about how can IP be free? How is software should be free? What is this collaborative development? How is this going to change the world? Right? And as, you, as, you, as we fast forward to today, open source is an integral part of almost every major technology company out there on the planet today. Open source allows people to harness the intellectual horsepower of the global developer community to build better products for people. Now, Back in the days when I started at Red Hat, we were trying to figure out our business model. And it was so funny because I had a number of friends, too, who were also in software sales. And they would complain about how hard their job was and how tough this sale was. And I would tell them, I don't want to hear how hard and tough your sale was because I picked one of the, one of the three things in this world that are intrinsically free, and I'm trying to sell that. It's either air, water, or open source software. So we figured out, if you can figure out how to sell open, free open source software, you can probably sell pretty much anything on the planet. And you know, Red Hat, of course, they become very successful. We figured out the business model. We figured out some very fun uh, ways to get people to understand the value of buying a commercially supported Linux operating system, et cetera. The point of this is I've always gravitated towards disruptive technologies. After Red Hat, I uh, joined a company called RPATH. It was a small startup found, founded by a bunch of ex-Red Hat executives and, and founding engineers. And this is in 2006 or so, or 2007, when we had this idea that eventually application software will be delivered in these things that we call virtual appliances and would land on this thing that was called the hypervisor. In a sense, this is really pre-virtualization going mainstream. And we were selling to software companies, and they all looked at us like we had three heads. They're like, what are you guys talking about? This will never happen. 
right? Fast forward to today, this is exactly how software is distributed, whether it be containerized or whether it be a VM on a virtualized environment. But that led me to AWS back in 2009. At that point in time, AWS was tiny. I think the entire company would probably have fit in half of this ballroom. The entire sales and partnering organization would have filled up these first three tables here. Right? It was an amazing experience to kind of to go through that and see the transformation that, op that uh, Amazon introduced to the world with the first, what we call the first wave of cloud computing. I'll talk a little bit more about where the evolution of cloud computing is going now and why it's so important for us to have partners like Xenos who are actually leaning into the ways in which we believe cloud computing is going to change the world in this next generation of it. But one of the things that I learned along the way is that disruption is happening at a much faster pace than we'd ever expect. And the reason, behind, reason why is because, look, innovations grow exponentially because every innovation today was built on an innovation that came before it. So it is an exponential growth curve if you're trying to measure the rate of innovation. Cloud actually accelerates that because cloud, what cloud does is because it makes infrastructure so easily accessible, right? It makes it easy accessible to anybody in the world. You can spin it up very quickly from a time and cost standpoint. It's, it's, it's basically like using electricity, right? So what it does is it basically increases the rate of invention and increases the rate of experimentation, which allows people to actually test things faster, develop faster, move faster, innovate faster. And as a result, the industry is changing at a much faster rate every single day. And as Xenos spoke when they launched Xenos Cloud, congratulations, by the way, right? Like you guys are, under, you understand the rate in which innovation is happening. And if you're not disrupting the market, somebody else will, right? So <clears throat> one of the things that when I think about the kind of where the rate, the, this rate of disruption and how it's accelerating, it's we, in a very, very short period of time, We've gone from what was you know, first generation, first wave cloud, really, which was actually co-location. Right? Prior to co-location, everybody kept their servers and server racks and server closets in their own, you know, in their own basements or if they were large enough, they ran their own data centers. Co-location co gave people the ability to do consolidation. Right? You could consolidate, you could have somebody operate the actual logistics of running the, your data center better than you could, but it was still physical. Right? The second wave of cloud, really pioneered by Amazon, by AWS, was a virtualized version of that, right? creating digital counterparts for physical objects. Right? Virtual servers versus physical servers, virtual disks versus physical disks, networking, et cetera, et cetera. But it didn't fundamentally change the design of software or the architecture of software. The concept of lift and shift personifies that. Right? You take an existing legacy application and you move it from one piece of infrastructure to a more agile, less expensive infrastructure, but the architecture is still the same. Right? It, it, and again, don't, don't get me wrong, it's been a tremendous disruptive force in the industry, upending nearly a trillion dollar enterprise IT uh, infrastructure and hardware market in a matter of, really, in a matter of a decade, less than a decade. Right? And that, in and of itself, has been massively transformational. And if you look at Every single time there's been a major wave of disruptive technology that came through. So open source, distributed computing using commodity, um, uh, using Windows and Linux as operating systems, to virtualization, to SaaS, to cloud. The one big difference that cloud brought to the market was it actually changed the business model. It changed the relationship between supplier and consumer. Right? Every other transition that happened before that, it was the same model. Right? Somebody had a product, you bought it, you bought what they sold you, not how much you necessarily needed or the features that you needed. You bought it, and then you bought refreshes of it. Cloud actually changed the way and changed the dynamic between supplier and consumer, where now the consumers have much more power. Consumers choose what they want to use, when they want to use it, and that actually puts a lot more responsibility and pressure on the vendors, which, in my opinion, is a good thing. Vendors should be doing things that customers need. We should be building products and services that customers need to make it available to them when they need it. It puts more pressure on us, but ultimately it becomes a better customer experience, which is why the Xenos Cloud is something that we are so happy and so proud for you that you guys are able to launch it, because I do really believe it's gonna change the way you interface with your customers, you provide value to your customers, and ultimately you're gonna help your customers solve problems in a more meaningful way. What made me interested about joining Google was this third wave. 
Because I mentioned, you know, what we did was we replaced commodity physical hardware with commodity virtualized hardware sold over the internet. What never changed, though, was the way that people design software for a modern way of using it, right? Things like machine learning, which I'll talk about. Things like globally distributed databases. Things that were actually, that solved problems that no more than three or four years ago would have thought impossible. But in some ways, in, in many ways, actually Google figured out ways to do it. Oftentimes, five, six, seven years ago, before we brought it to market as a commercial product. But Google's approach to this next wave of cloud, we fundamentally believe is gonna change the way people actually design software to make it smarter and more valuable to customers. So as, I, so as I've gone through my journey, the one thing that I also have realized is you gotta stick to what you're good at. You figure out what is core, and then you figure out how you build on that. You figure out how do you actually take what you do very, very well and continue to do better at it, right? It, it, it kind of prevents you from chasing the shiny object issue, right? Which is, oh, that was cool over there. Let me go try and do this, right? And oftentimes you spend a lot of time and money and energy doing that, and you're taking your eye off the ball, which is things that, core, that are core to your business. So I'll spend a, minute, a few minutes here talking about things that are core to Google as a whole, how we're bringing that to market through Google Cloud, and why we believe by us focusing on what's core to Google allows our partners and allows our customers, therefore, focus on what's core to them. So the first one is speed. Right, so speed matters. Right? Speed matters a lot in business, whether it be time to market, right? whether it be the ability to process transactions, whether it be getting a bid in on something before somebody else. Speed ultimately is a massive competitive advantage for anybody out there in the market. But the reality is, when you're talking about the internet, you know, no, matter how science, no, no matter how sophisticated we get with computer science and technology, we still have to deal with two things, speed of light and distance. And both of those things are very, very, very hard to engineer around. Now, you can do things to actually start to try and mitigate the negative impact of the speed of light, which is actually quite fast, and, and distance, right? But distance is a physical phenomenon, it's a reality. Right, so one of the things that you know, Google realizing that, look, speed when it comes to the internet world is going to be the key to the success of any company that's going to be a major player, we have to take things into our own hands. Not a lot of people understand that Google actually is, has the largest privately owned high-speed fiber network in the world. We do not depend on third-party service providers at all. We actually sell excess inven bandwidth inventory to third-party service providers. The map here basically shows the routing of our transatlantic, transpacific cables, all of the different uh, points of presence that we have, all the different hubs that we have around the planet. I'll talk about, I'll talk about this, globe, this, this network here in a, in, in later on in the presentation when it comes to security. When it comes to speed, it's super important when you think about how traditional providers work versus how Google Cloud works. Traditional providers actually you know, build their, maintain their data centers, et cetera, but then once they exit their data center, they're operating on public infrastructure, right? So there's this thing called hot potato, right? They take a packet, a data packet, your data packet, and then they move it across somebody else's cable. And then it gets transferred to somebody else's cable. Then it gets transferred to somebody else's pop. And then it gets transferred to somebody else's pop, then somebody else's cable, et cetera, et cetera, to ultimately to the point in time it gets to the user. But every time you make a hop, that introduces latency, right? So by Google owning our own, completely owned fiber network, we don't have a hot potato approach. We have what we call uh, the cold potato, right? <laughs> Which is, we, we're not trying to get rid of the packet as fast as we can. We want to hold on to the packet for you to ensure that we actually can get that packet to its destination faster than anybody else in the world can. So we basically hold that data packet all the way, all the way, all the way to really the last mile. Eventually it pops out to a local ISP, typically within the same city, in some cases maybe even the same building as where the end destination is. Right? But by us being able to do that, we prevent all the hopping. Right? And we can control the data, we can control the traffic, we can control the speeds, and we control the consistency of our network. So again, speed matters when you're thinking about the world, which I'll talk about here in a second, is very important when you're dealing with, again, 
speed of light, and distance. How do you optimize to make sure that you have a competitive advantage against others when you're dealing with those two, con those two, those two constants? Next, global matters. The really cool thing about the internet in general, and cloud computing in particular, is that it has made the world a much smaller place. You, customers, I mean, companies can now reach customers all the way around the world instantly. Going to market now doesn't mean going to market in your local geography. Going to market means going to market globally. The only question is how quickly and how far do you want to go? All right, so global does matter. Now, you know, every cloud provider puts up these slides, so it's a coming upon me to put this up too, but when you think about global scale and global reach, think about the fact that like what's core to Google is global. We didn't start our business thinking regionally and then figuring out how we actually then start to incrementally go farther from the headquarters. Right? We actually thought about the world, designed systems globally, and then made sure that things were optimized at a local level. Right? So the pro, the, our points of presence, our data centers, our regions, et cetera, have always been designed attached to our global network to make sure that we are providing a fully global experience with a global con control plane for customers to help ensure the fact that when they want to go to market halfway around the world, that they can do that faster and more reliably than anybody else on the planet. Quite a little segue here when I talk about this next technology. We'll, I'll read it and then I'll explain kind of what it means in a, in a hopefully a fun little story that it helps explain kind of my thought process when I was moving from one cloud company to the other. But global, I mean, Cloud Spanner, the only enterprise grade, globally distributed, and strongly consistent database service built for the cloud specifically, specifically to combine the benefits of a relational database structure with non relational horizontal scale. Big mouthful of a lot of technical jargon, right? But what does that ultimately mean? So, when I when people I started to talk to people at Google probably in the fall of 2015 or so, or winter 2015, some of the folks that I had known and trusted had gone there, and they say, "Hey, you should come check us out." So I started to do some research. Cloud Spanner is now a publicly available service, right? So there's an API that anybody can ask, go out there and use it. But I actually found a white paper on my own doing some research to figure out what is this Spanner thing. Google invented Spanner because they had to be able to know to the millisecond if bids for competitive advertising real estate were coming in from different parts of the world, which ones came in first? Because that's the, the business of ads, right? You're selling virtual advertising real estate and people are bidding for that, for that placement. Now, with traditional databases, especially structured databases, that's very difficult to do. One of the biggest problems of the database market has always been how do you actually do real-time replication and real-time synchronization, right? It's something that people have spent billions and billions of dollars trying to figure out how to synchronize structured databases, right? So, you know, things like do, you know, uh, hot swappable, moving, read writes, all these kind of things, rack, et cetera. How do you actually create multiple copies, consistent copies across multiple um, structured databases? So when I was talking to my mother about, hey, I'm thinking of leaving Amazon, and I think I'm going to this company, yeah, I'm going to, going to go to Google, of course she knows Google, but she knows Google because she uses Gmail, and when she needs to look something up, she uses the search bar. She's like, what, what are you gonna do at Google? I mean, Google basically, aren't they like a kind of a white pages, so to speak, you can look up stuff? I'm like, well, mom, let me, let me explain the reason why I'm looking at it. And one of the reasons I explained to her is Cloud Spanner. Now, of course, if I read this to my mother, she'd look at me cross-eyed, which she did. But the way I tried to explain it to her was like, look, mom, you have a filing cabinet at home, you and dad have a filing cabinet at home, which they do, and that filing cabinet has a file system, which they designed. Right, it's alphabetical and based off of you know, categories of stuff. So, well, Mom, what if you wanted to make a copy of that file system or that filing cabinet? How would you do it? She's like, well, I'd get another filing cabinet and I would replicate the file system that I have in it. I copy all the files and I put it into the second filing cabinet. Okay, great, but every time that you changed a file, you'd have to change it again in the secondary one. She's like, yeah, okay. Would that be easy? She's like, no, it'd be kind of problematic, but it's, it's possible. Could you do it instantaneously? Well, no, but you know, there's some, it takes some, some time, but we could actually make it happen. I say, okay, well, what if we wanted to solve the house burn down problem? 
You have two filing cabinets sitting next to each other, your house burns down, you still lose both copies of your data. So mom, how would you do this if you actually put the second filing cabinet on the other side of the country? She said, well, that's a very hard problem to solve. I'm like, you're right. What Google's done with Spanner is Google, and this is the only real-time, consistently synchronized structured database. And the way that Google did this, it's almost magic. Google, in order to, be, to do this, Google actually leveraged and created their own GPS network and created an atomic clock system that they actually used to, uh, to make globally synchronize the time across every single data center across Google's, Google's network to make sure that when copies come into one, we know instantly halfway around the world that something came in here and it's automatically synchronized. So think about the impact the global span, that, that Cloud Spanner has to modern business applications, right? So prior to Spanner, databases and database technologies were always based in these silos, right? No matter how hard you tried to get globally consistent, it was very difficult, if not impossible. Well, Cloud Spanner, that's possible now. So what I'm excited about here at Google is our ability to help people who are building business applications, whether these are commercial products that you're selling in the market, or whether these are for internal business applications. But think about companies that depend on supply chain management, inventory management, medical records management, things like that where you want to know and you should be able to know, and it becomes a competitive advantage for you to know exactly to the millisecond what your inventory looks like here, Beijing, Mumbai, Singapore, Sao Paulo. That is possible now. You can actually now build applications that will, can be completely globally synchronized from a data structure standpoint. So that's something that's very interesting and very exciting. Next is security matters. <clears throat> and this is one of these things, it's like, well, of course it, of course it does. It's kind of a uh, dumb moment. And it's one of these things where nowadays it is table stakes, right? It's table stakes at a high-end poker table. What most people have become accustomed to is the fact that large cloud service providers take care of all of this stuff for you. Again, focusing on core what's core to us to make sure that you are freed up to focus on what's core to you, right? Like Google, Google's reputation is based on security. It's based on keeping our customers' data secure, keeping um, bad known threats out of our network, and actually in many ways identifying major threats that happen to the global internet, right? But security does matter. Now, of course, we also have you know, these slides, and again, these are table stakes. But the point being is here is that customers and partners should not have to worry about making sure that you have the certificates and accreditations to operate your business securely anywhere in the world. That's our job. And that's our job, that's other cloud service providers' jobs, and that's something that we take it upon ourselves because we have to do it for our business. It's core to us. All right now, I'll bring the network map slide up here again because I do think this one's actually a fun one also because it has to deal with security as well. It's not just speed, it's security. So the other mother story was I was trying to explain to her again about, okay, well, she didn't quite get the, this cloud spanner thing, but I didn't expect her to. That's a fairly complex one. So what I did was try to explain to her, okay, let's do this in a physical world scenario. So a very, you know, the other large cloud provider that I work for based in Seattle, Washington, you know, their primary business also, well, their primary business is uh, e-commerce, right? It's where they actually move physical inventory of product around the world. So what they do is they spend billions and billions of dollars every year optimizing efficiencies in their fulfillment centers which are their massive warehouses that hold all the inventory of products that people buy. Right now, they, again, billions of dollars of intellectual property, equipment, robots, everything, to reduce the, pack, the item picking time by a second or two. Because if you can actually make the picker, the person who's actually picking the product out of a shelf and putting it into a box, if you can make them one second faster on every single box they're packaging, across a billion boxes, that does re amount to a tremendous amount of savings, right? So they spend billions of dollars optimizing their fulfillment, fulfillment centers, logistics around that, and arguably they are the best people in the world at it. They're really, really, 
really good at it. The reality, though, is no matter how good they are at increasing the efficiencies in the fulfillment centers, once those, once those items are on a truck, and that truck is out, leaves the loading dock, that truck is on public infrastructure. So no matter how optimized they are, again, in their domain that they control, once the truck's on public infrastructure, it's out of their hands. Right? You can no longer control the security, availability, or speed in which that truck is going to get to its destination. Draw bridges could get stuck, traffic accident could happen, weather anomaly, all these kinds of things could happen that are outside of your control. And I explained this to my mother and I said, look, well, imagine, if, imagine if they had their own network of highways that they controlled, physical highways that they controlled. When the truck leaves the loading dock, it gets onto the highway, that thing can do 100 miles an hour safely because you control the traffic that's on it. You know who's on it, right? You're monitoring who's on it, right? You, you've allowed access for people to get on it, but it's your highway system. Explain, look, in the, 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 the reason why Google is so compelling is we've done that in the digital world, right? Just replace fulfillment center with data center, right? Everybody, every single cloud provider out there spends billions of dollars in data center optimization. And I think it's arguable as far as who's better at it. Everybody's really good at it. Some of us, uh, some of us <laughs> are better at it than others. But the point being is, we then, when that packet, just like we talked about the last time, when it leaves our data center, it's traveling across our own network, right? Which also allows us to reduce the security exposure for customers who are traversing data through the Google Cloud environment. All right, so security, again, security matters, speed matters, networking matters. Next one is intelligence matters. And again, of course, this is a, a duh moment kind of thing. Right? Of course, intelligence matters. But what we're talking about here now is really what's becoming the next wave, if not already the next wave of cloud computing, is machine learning and artificial intelligence. Right? And the ways in which machine learning are starting to impact the way people are designing and building products and solving problems is absolutely fascinating. So the one thing that my business focuses on is helping software companies, like Xenos, helping software companies build more valuable products that they can take to market. Because if we can help them build more powerful, more intelligent products that they can take to market, it increases their competitive advantage, it makes their products more valuable, it makes them stickier with their customers, and then ultimately, collectively, we win together. When, we talk, when I talked about earlier about the various phases of cloud computing, when you go from colo to, again, virtualized hardware, the architecture and design of applications never changed. Right? You're moving things from one environment to the other. Massive efficiencies, massive cost savings, massive agility gains, but you're not changing the way applications work at a fundamental level. It, to me, it's one of these things that it's almost a personal crusade of mine is to try and go out there and help software companies figure out how do you actually make your software smarter? Meaning, how does it actually improve every single day? The notion that traditional enterprise business applications today are statically configured is somewhat mind-blowing considering the technologies that exist today to make it not so. What I mean by that is if you think about an ERP system that processes, it, that processes any type of business transaction, Right? It takes a transaction from this point, and it takes it to this point. Right? And the second one that goes across that, process exactly the same way, because it's a statically configured application. But with machine learning nowadays, the second transaction process through should be incrementally better than the first. The third, incrementally better than the second. By the time you get to the millionth transaction process through that application, it should be exponentially better. And when I mean by better, I mean it should be faster, it should be more accurate, it should be more secure, and it should be more efficient on resources because the system itself is actually learning while it's going, right? You're designing software now to self-optimize as they are actually handling the business processes that their customers are doing. So think about the impact of machine learning and AI embedded into business applications. That is massively transformational. That helps customers solve problems in powerful ways that they never could before. Because you were always confined 
based off of pre first generation cloud, you're always confined based off of the physical IT assets that you had. Now you're confined based off of the limitations of a statically configured and developed application. But you start to inject things like machine learning into the application itself, it makes the application smarter, right? So you, your customers start to get incremental more value every single time they use it. And it happens automatically, right? This, that is what we are out here to do, is to work with software companies to help them build smarter products. Now, of course, you know, Google has been working on AI for decades. If you think of any of the major products that Google has in the market, things like Gmail, Maps, YouTube, Android, all these major products uh, that, that we have out there, they all have AI and machine learning built into them. We were doing these things before they were actually a mainstream, uh, mainstream piece of technology that people are actually starting to adopt uh, in masses, right? But we do things like, I mean, we actually create things like TensorFlow that we open source, which allows other people to build machine learning models, right? We actually design our own chipsets called tensor processing units to basically optimize some machine learning to make sure that our customers are able to run the machine learning models faster than anybody else on the planet, right? So when you're thinking about how to actually put machine learning to use in a practical sense, no matter what your business is, it is possible for you today to start thinking this broadly. How do you actually start to make your systems intelligent, right? That frees you up to then focus on other things like your customers, product design, UI, support, things of that, things of that nature, and leave some of this technology stuff that you're, is readily accessible. Let us continue to innovate on it. Let us bring it to market. Let us have, let you use it and let, let us help you build better products for your customers. Again, let's build smarter products together, which is one of the things I love about the Xenos Cloud is because they're already thinking about this, right? They're looking at ways to put machine learning into their, their technology and their tooling for you as their customer to give you more predictive view into your IT operations, right? To learn about what the traffic patterns are, to learn about the alerts, to learn about how your, your internal infrastructure is operating so they can be more predictive versus reactive. And then finally, reliability matters, right? So <clears throat> reliability is about, when I mentioned earlier about part of what's core to Google is security, because if we're not secure, we, our reputation is at risk, and reputation and trust are the things that matter most in corporate industry today and working with customers. Reliability is a very close second to that, right? Which is if Google search bar is down or Google Cloud is not available, or YouTube is not available, or for goodness sakes, YouTube Kids from my son is not available, right? You're gonna hear about it right away. So reliability matters. So when we, this also relates to the, 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 other, the, the previous core principle, which is intelligence matter, is that rely, intelligence, we're actually helping the world do that through technology, through software. Reliability, we're actually helping customers uh, improve their reliability of their web-based applications through people intelligence, right? So <clears throat> we actually have this, we pioneered this concept called site reliability engineering. So when Google had to figure out how to operate Google products at scale with ultimate levels of reliability that customers have come to expect, it's a very hard problem to solve when you're dealing with billions of customers, billions of users all the time on a global basis. So we actually pioneered this thing called site reliability engineering, which is a very, it's a mindset, it's a skill set, it requires certain types of operationally and software engineering minded people to work together from development of a product, architecture of a product, to operationalizing a product, right? We have this elegant handoff process internally at Google between the engineers that design the products and the teams that actually support and operate the products to make sure that there is collaboration in the event that there is any type of reliability issues. And as a matter of fact, on this slide, we've actually written two books. The second book of which is actually going to be released here on, I think, July 24th. So get a copy of that. Sorry, another book plug here as a, on a keynote. But these are things, again, in the spirit of openness from Google, we believe that, we want, we believe that this type of knowledge should be shared. It shouldn't be held proprietary to us. 
because we believe that the more reliability, the, the greater the reliability of any web connected application or system is to the benefit of all. So we actually do want to share this knowledge and get it out there to people who are managing and running operations. So what we've done is we've also externalized this. So site reliability engineering, which is SRE. We've actually externalized this to customer reliability engineering, or CRE, where similar to how our SRE experts worked with internal Google product teams, we now have SRE experts that work with our customers' product teams. One of the things that was so exciting for me to be able to come here and speak to you and support the Xenos conference is that one of the programs my team designed was the ability for us to externalize CRE to our SaaS ISV partners. Because the, the ability for us to help our ISV, SaaS ISV partners, learn how to identify what their service level indicators should be. How do you know your system is running reliable, reliably? What is your architectural design? What are your SLOs or service level objectives and how do you hit those? Right? And then infusing some of the Google knowledge for, at, a, at a people level, operational knowledge that we've honed over 18 years, for us to be able to share that with Xenos is, is for us tremendously rewarding. And at the same time, what we hope is it has a massive impact for you as Xenos' as customers. So Xenos was actually one of the first partners that we ran through our SaaS CRE program. It's not even publicly announced yet at this point. It's still pretty much in beta phase. Um, you'll probably hear about it at uh, our conference next that's coming up here in July. But one of the things that we love about the partnership with Xenos is they actually trusted us and said, I believe that's valuable. I believe that's important. If we can learn best practices from a company like Google, that's a good partnership. Right, so thank you very much for giving us the opportunity to engage with your, your talented team to make sure that, again, for your customers, you're going to be able to operate Xenos Cloud in the most reliable Google-style level of reliability. Just to wrap up, when it comes to sticking with the core, right? Like, if you think about what Google's mission statement is, it really is about data and intelligence. And this, you know, this was coined uh, uh, back when the company was founded, but you know, our overall mission is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful, right? And this is something that, again, we designed and the mission was established when Google was primarily a search company. But actually what's interesting and actually fascinating in many ways is that as Google has moved into various different businesses, this mission statement is still very much applicable. Right? It's about helping customers use their data smartly and actually then taking making actionable intelligence, that, and using the, their intelligence to make actionable, excuse me, to take action on things that are gonna impact their business and their customers. And today, I mean, we have seven products and growing that serve over one billion users each, all powered by the cloud, all powered by the technologies that we just talked about, the network we talked about, technologies like Spanner, technologies like machine learning and artificial intelligence, operational expertise with very smart people like from our SRE team. Right? These are things that we now are, are externalizing to the broader market. Oh, I'd actually be remiss if you are interested in learning, if I didn't mention this, if you, if you are interested in learning more about our CRE um, uh, process and program, there is a talk today at 1045 given by a good friend of mine, uh, Henry Robertson, um, here in one of the breakout rooms. Please join this talk, learn a little bit more about how Google CRE works and how could you actually apply that to your business. And lastly, I would, again, a shameless plug though, but we're working on our, uh, our big conf annual conference in San Francisco coming up here in July. If you're interested at all about learning more about what Google Cloud is doing, what Google is doing in general, and how we actually are working with customers, working with partners, et cetera, please spend a, a nice cold July in San Francisco with, I don't know, 10 to 15,000 of your closest friends. So with that, uh, thank you very much. Really appreciate you uh, taking the time to come out here on this show today.